There are these values which uh, we believe to be foundational in our world. They are that every life matters. Every person is of equal worth, irrespective of their race or age or wealth or gender or disability or anything else. Every life matters matters. But the question is, where does that value come from? Because, um, well, it's not obvious. The uh, United States Declaration of Independence says, we hold these things to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. But in actual fact, and with great respect to the founding fathers, it's not self-evident at all. For all of the wonders of science, Biology and physics will not get you to those values. In fact, um, theirs is a rather cold and unfeeling universe. Neither is it an enlightenment idea. Greek or Roman philosophy certainly don't suggest this. And in fact, they would treat the weak mercilessly. No, that most foundational idea, that all lives matter, actually emerged in the middle of the first century and endured despite the best efforts of tyrants and empires. Because, of course, where it emerges from is Jesus of Nazareth. The irony is, of course, that in a world that seeks to throw off the Christian faith, the very values which underpin our most basic beliefs are Christian values. Justice for all, no matter who they are, equality, democracy itself. These things are not self-evidence. They are Christian in origin. And the beautiful psalm that we just had read is one of the most profound expressions of this. Why does every life matter? Because every human being, no matter who they are, is known by God and is fearfully and wonderfully made. It's a marvelous psalm. I'm going to just draw a few themes out of it. I hope these will be helpful to you. The first is this. You are known better than you know yourself. So this is from verse one. You search me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. There is this hunger in all of us to to know and to be known. We are made for connection and relationships. And we long for someone else to understand us. But I suspect that you, like all of us, find that that's actually quite hard to come by. And even the best relationships fall short of that. And the reason for that, of course, is that there is this God-shaped hole within each of us that the best of our relationships cannot meet that same need for connection because we were created for relationship with God. It's an astonishing thing that the psalm says, actually, because in the ancient world, the gods were generally considered to be distant and cold and considerably more interested in their own agenda than in us. And yet here we are able to say that God knows you. He knows your heart and your soul, your strengths and your weaknesses, your failings and the secret things that you tell nobody else. And nevertheless, he loves you enough to die for you. And of course, the truth is that we don't really understand ourselves. The more we go on, the more we realize how complex we are as people with this amazing mixture of kind of nature and nurture and rational and subconscious and environment and experience. Um, There's a lovely line in um, Lord of the Rings. Tolkien talks about hobbits and he says, um, you can learn all that there is to know about their ways in a month and after a hundred years they can still surprise you. And it's true of human beings too. You might think you know someone really well and yet they still catch us by surprise because we are more complex than we know. It takes a lifetime to get to know someone, and they still surprise you. And yet, God knows us better than we know ourselves. And he is the one who can help us to understand ourselves and make sense of all of that complexity. You are known better than you know yourself. 
The second thing to say is that our lives exist within the purposes of God. So the really interesting verse in verse 5 says this. It says, you hem me in behind and before. And it's a really interesting and carefully worded phrase that comes, I think, from David's experience of essentially trying to get away from God and realizing that he can't. You know, life is not a random sequence of events, but neither is it kind of pre-programmed. Neither are we the victim of fate. That, um, That God allows us our freedom. He allows us to make our mistakes. And yet he is never far from us. And he has this amazing um, uh, ability to to draw us back to himself. Um, It's an amazing picture of the way that God kind of guides our lives and calls us to trust in him. And if we do that, we will not go too far wrong. You are known better than you know yourself. Your life exists within the purposes of God. Third, you are never alone. This is verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there also. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. I don't know if you can hear what's going on in that text, but it's the picture of someone fleeing from God. And you may have had that in that experience in your life. I know there have been times when I have tried to get away from God and discovered that you just can't do it. It doesn't matter how far you go to the highest heights or the greatest depths, God is still there. I don't know if that's consoling or slightly intimidating. It's probably something of, uh, it depends where you are with God in that. But what it does mean is that you need never be afraid because God is never far from you. And people have discovered that God is there even in the darkest places in this world, whether that be battlefields or concentration camps. Even there, people have found that it's possible to reach out and discover that God is not far from each of us. That invitation is there for all of us. Knock, and the door will be opened. Seek, and you will find you are never alone. And finally, your life matters. In a world where all too often we are treated as only as valuable as what we can do, or the wealth that we have, or the job that we do, and then are otherwise dismissed unless we can prove our value, we say these words. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that well. God says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, whoever you are. And, um, and your life is made for a purpose. His works are wonderful, and you are his handiwork. The word um, fearful doesn't mean to be afraid. It means with great care and attention to detail. It's like an artist crafting a great work. And God says that of you. Do you ever stop to look at yourself and think just how astonishing it is to be alive, to be a human being? Isaac Newton famously said, in the absence of any other proof, the human hand alone would convince me of God's existence. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are God's handiwork. It's an astonishing thing to say. But of course, as I say, that means that we are made for a purpose. That a relationship with our creator isn't just a thing that we do. It's not just a a lifestyle choice. It's the very heart of who we are. From the very beginning, we've said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord. And our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And it's from that that everything else flows, that we find strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. We find our identity and our calling and our purpose. Psalm 139 is one of the greats. 
It is a profound statement of what it means to be human and the value that each of us have, no matter who we are. You are of immeasurable worth, no matter what the world says about you. But of course, with that value comes responsibility. What will you do with this one wild and precious life that you have been given? Maybe the first answer is here. Did you see the psalmist said, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And the first step in response to realizing what an astonishing thing it is to be created is thankfulness. That ability to give thanks for who we are and for who God is and the part we get to play in his purposes. And as we express that thankfulness, so we are helped to live our lives well to orient ourselves away from ourselves towards others and towards God and open ourselves up to the relationship with God that we are created for, to be truly known and to be truly loved, to be never alone and never beyond the presence of God and to find that no matter who we are, life has meaning in the vast purposes of God as his kingdom comes in this world. Amen.